Let's take your Bibles once again, go back to Matthew chapter 13. This is a big chapter to get through. I'm going to do my best like that I can here. Matthew chapter 13. And let's start off by reading verse number 35. Matthew 13 verse 35. It says here that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So Matthew chapter 13 is this big secret that's been uh, kept secret since the foundation of the world. And Jesus Christ wants us to know this secret. Now notice that in verse 35, it says that which was fulfilled by, which was spoken by the prophet. Now, if you want to know where that's being written, you don't need to turn there. Well, oh, actually, turn there, turn there. Keep your finger there. Keep your finger in, in Matthew 13 and go to Psalm 78. This is something that was written by a psalmist. Okay, and notice that Jesus Christ calls the psalmists prophets. Okay, they're not just songwriters, but these psalms that you have in your Bible were written by prophets themselves. Look at Psalm 78 verse 2. Psalm 78 verse 2. This is where Jesus Christ was quoting from. It says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Dark sayings. That which was held, kept secret from the foundation of the world there. And so the title of the sermon tonight, guys, is Dark Sayings. Sayings. Okay, it's so the title of the sermon tonight. Dark sayings. Let's keep reading there in verse number 3. Psalm 78 verse 3. It says, Which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Hey, these were sayings that were known by, by uh, the Old Testament prophets. These were sayings that were passed down from generation to generation. Fathers to the children, and then to their children. Verse number 4. It says, We will not hide them from our children, Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. Okay, now go back to Matthew chapter 13, please. The title, once again, was Dark Saints. I want you to see that these parables, these mysteries were written in old time. They were written in the Old Testament. And yet it's, it's in the New Testament times as Christ comes teaching his disciples he unravels these secrets he unravels these mysteries and so we have a great honor of knowing these parables by knowing these truths now what i want you to notice about matthew 13 here is that the whole chapter there are seven parables altogether this is the main chapter in the book of matthew that goes into parables yes there are other chapters that have parables but this is the main one this is the main one where jesus christ just focuses on a number of parables now, one thing I want you to notice, just, just think about this. If Jesus Christ calls these dark sayings, if Jesus Christ calls them secrets, do you think they're going to be a little challenging to understand? Of course, they'll be a little challenging to understand. Even the Old Testament prophets had a hard time understanding them. Okay? Now, think about this. If they are challenging to understand, if they're difficult to understand, do you think you should build your doctrines on parables? I would say no. In fact, most pastors, most preachers, most teachers will tell you, don't build your doctrines on parables. Okay? When you build your doctrines, the things that you believe on the Word of God, build it on things that are clear. Build it on things that are easy to understand. You know, the salvation message, easy to understand, right? John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that it's by faith on Christ, that it's without the deeds of the law. Right? When you understand something that's simple and then you read a parable and that parable you go, wow, that sounds like salvation by works. Should you change your doctrine based on the parable? No. Obviously, if, if you've come to a conclusion about a parable that contradicts something that's clear in the scriptures, then you've got the parable wrong. Okay? You haven't understood the parable properly. Parables are there to help, um, to help the doctrines that you already believe. The, the crystal clear doctrines, the fundamental doctrines that you've already established with clear teaching on the Bible, the parables should then come and help build on those things you've already believed. Okay? So be careful. I'm just warning you. Be careful of those that build brand new doctrines or doctrines that are contrary to the fundamentals of the faith by using parables. Just be careful. Okay? Because I, I've seen people, they know that salvation is eternal life, they know it's for all eternity. They know it's once saved, always saved. They know you cannot lose your salvation. But then they read some parable and go, hold on, this sounds like you can lose your salvation. And then they, they change the doctrines to fit what they believe that parable is about. Okay, but no, parables are there to be aligned with doctrines we already believe and understand. So be careful with your parables. All right. Now let's uh, go to Matthew 13 verse 10. 
Now, as I, as I teach for this chapter, we are going to bounce around a lot in this chapter. We're not going to go from, from verse 1 all the way to the end. We're going to be bouncing around a lot. And I, I've done that on purpose just to help put it together. Okay? Let's start off with verse number 10. Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? I mean, that's a good question. If they're hard to understand, if it requires a lot of study and thought and teaching, why do you speak to people in parables? He tells Jesus. Verse 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now, some people find this really hard to understand. Okay, But you see, there is a doctrine okay, called the reprobate doctrine in the Bible where there are certain people that God does not want for them to believe and be saved. That's hard for us to grasp because we know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, the whole world, that He gave His only begotten Son. And of course, I'm not saying to you that Jesus did not die for everybody. That's a teaching of Calvinism, that's limited atonement, teaching that Jesus Christ only died for some. No, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died for all men. Okay, all men, especially to them that believe. But to all men, Jesus Christ came to die. But you see, there can come a point in time when you reject the Lord Jesus Christ so many times. You reject the gospel, okay? Or we've seen the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And we know the future, people that take the mark of the beast. These kinds of people, they're still walking the earth. But it's too late for them. They can no longer believe the gospel. They can no longer understand the truths of Scripture. Okay? And you'll see that these parables are there to hide the truth to these reprobates. To hide the truth to those that will not understand. And we'll see this as we keep reading. If you find this hard to believe, let's just keep reading. It says there in verse number 12. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And he shall have no more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that, uh, even that he hath. So, it, so even, even if someone does not have, well, what are we talking about here? Someone that does not have the Lord, someone that is not saved, someone that gets to a point of reprobation. It says that it's going to be taken away. Even, even the things that they hear will be taken away from them. Let's keep reading verse 13. Therefore I speak, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, that's Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Now notice this, verse 15 is so important. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. You say, what is that about? He's saying, look, I'm, I'm speaking to them in parables because I do not want them now to hear. I don't want them to see because if they did hear, if they did believe, they could be converted and I would heal them. In other words, what Jesus Christ is saying, I don't want to heal these people anymore. They're, 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 they're beyond saving. Okay, they've rejected me too many times. They're not going to receive the truth. And so I'm going to speak to them in parables so I can continue hiding the truth of the gospel from them. Amen. This is hard to understand. It's not preached in your average church. Okay, but this is what Jesus Christ... I'm going to read to you. Maybe it's a bit clearer. From Isaiah 6.9. You don't need to turn there. Isaiah 6.9, which, which is what Christ is quoting from. It says here, And he said, Go and tell these people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not, make the heart of these people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. See, no, God's saying to Isaiah here, and we know the double application it is to, to Jesus Christ, is that, look, I want you to preach to them, but their hearts are just going to wax worse. Their, their eyes are just going to be blinded on purpose. Look. They will not hear. They will not hear. They will not be healed. They will not understand. They will not be converted. All right? Difficult, difficult doctrine for a lot of people to understand. Let's keep... Go, are you back in... Uh, you guys should be in Matthew 13, right? Let's keep reading verse number 16. Verse number 16. Now, this is the blessing for us, guys. This is the blessing. Verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now, look at this. 
For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Now let me alleviate any fears you may have. You might say, oh, but Pastor Kevin, you know, there are parables that I don't understand in the Bible. Does that mean I'm a reprobate? You know, because that's what we saw, right? Jesus Christ spoke in parables so they would not hear. Does that mean I'm one of those? You don't, you don't need to worry about that, okay? If you believe the gospel, you're fine, first of all. But secondly, what did he say in verse 17? That even prophets, even righteous men could not understand in the Old Testament days. They wish they had the truth that you've got today. They wish they had the understanding that you have today. And so what I'm saying to you guys is that parables are difficult to understand. It requires you to learn. It requires you to hear preaching on parables. It requires you to align it with fundamental doctrines of the faith that, are, that you already know. Okay, so it's, if you don't understand certain parables in the Bible, rest easy. You just need time to study it out. Okay, you need, you need, your eyes need to see, your ears need to be open to hear these truths. And when you do know them, Jesus says you're blessed. Okay, you have a blessing, a special blessing that's been given to you. Now, uh, let me say this just uh, quickly here. Say, so how do we understand parables? I'm going to read to you from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. I'll just read it to you. It says, a wise man, sorry, a wise man will hear. Okay, you want to be wise? You want to know parables? You just need to hear. Listen. And will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Hey, you need to have counsels that are wise. You need to go and listen to preaching of wise men. Now, I don't want to say that I'm a wise man, but what I'm trying to say to you is go and pre listen to preaching of men that are saved. Okay, men that are saved. People that are unsaved will not give you the knowledge of these parables. In fact, they will use the parables and teach false doctrines. But then it says this, verse 6, to understand a proverb and the interpretations, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Hey, what were the dark sayings when we compared it from uh, Psalm to Matthew 13? It's the parables, right? The parables are called dark sayings. How do we understand it? You need to be wise. You need to take on wise counsel and listen up. So what I'm asking you guys tonight is to listen up. Let's get back to verse number one now. Matthew 13, verse one. Matthew 13, verse one. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him. So that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in parables saying, behold, a soul went forth to sow. So this is the parable of the soul, a very, very famous parable uh, of Jesus Christ. And this parable, guys, will tell you usually like this is a parable that will f you'll find out a, fa a false prophet by. Okay, because the false prophet will take this parable of the sower and teach a gospel by works. Okay, now if you know, if you already say to me, no, I believe that the gospel salvation is by faith on Christ alone, without the works of the law, without the deeds of the law, then this parable will make sense to you. But to those that are unsaved, to those that are false prophets, they will take this same parable and start teaching a works-based gospel. Okay, so let's understand this. Let's go through it. Verse number four. So you know what a sower is. They sow seed, right? Verse number four. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by, by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. So the wayside um, is the, your footpath, if you want to consider, consider it that way. You know, if, if you keep treading the same ground, the ground becomes compressed, becomes hardened. Okay. Uh, what do Americans call foot, uh, footpaths? It's like on sidewalks. Right? They call them sidewalks. So it's kind of the same thing, the wayside, the sidewalk, the footpath. Okay? And fowls came and devoured them up. Why is that? Because the ground is hardened. The seed cannot sink into the ground. It's just sitting there on the surface. The, the, the birds see a free meal. They come in and eat that seed. Verse number five. Some fell upon stony places. So this is a place where it's rocky. And, the, and thorns sprung up and choked them. Um, sorry, I missed one, didn't I? Verse number five, sorry. Let me just start again. Verse number five. Some fell upon stony places uh, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. You see, this is seed that's falling to these stony places, okay? But it's a place that does not have much moisture. 
They sprung up, but when the sun came up, they were scorched because they didn't have enough moisture. Okay? Their roots had not dug in deep enough. They had no root. There it says in verse number 6. Verse number 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Verse 8. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some in a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who have ears to hear, let him hear. All right. So... I've heard this parable taught in two ways, okay? We have four examples of, of seed being sown, all right? And those that want to teach you a works-based gospel will say this. They'll say that the first three seeds that were sown, those that fell on the wayside, that, 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 that which fell on stony places, and that which uh, was, was sown amongst thorns, they were all unsaved people, they'll say. And the only one that got saved, they'll say, is that which was fruitful. Okay? And what I'm saying to you is those that teach it that way are usually adding a workspace gospel to the message of salvation. And what I want to say to you guys is that only the first uh, seeds that were sown, only that which had, uh, that was put on uh, the wayside, that represents the unsaved, that represents the non-believer, but all the other three seeds that were sown represent believers. Okay, that's what I'll say to you. Now I'm going to prove this to you as we go on, if you have any doubts here. Now what I'll get you to do is drop down to verse 18. So brother, we're in Matthew 13, and we'll go to verse 18. Verse 18. So we are jumping around a little bit, like I said, but you'll understand why. Because in verse, th verse 18, Jesus says, He, therefore, the parable of the sower. So now Jesus Christ is going to explain to us this parable. Now look at this. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Now, for you people that are soul winners, for you that go and knock doors, when you go and knock on someone's door, what are you trying to do? You're trying to win a soul, right? But how, how does that person get saved? They must first understand the gospel of the kingdom. They must first understand the gospel, right? Now, let me ask you this. If someone does not understand the gospel, they're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you going to go then, well, let's just pray and you get saved. <laughs> you know, of course, we would, you wouldn't do that, okay? You need to make sure they understand the gospel. So what is, what is Jesus saying about this first seed that was sown in verse number 19? Look at this. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not. Did this person understand the gospel? No. Could this person be a believer? No, because they could not understand, right? Now keep your finger there. This is so important. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 8. So important because Luke 8 gives us clarity here. Luke chapter 8 is the same parable. Okay, same parable, but it's taught a slightly different way. Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Look at this. Jesus, same parable by Jesus Christ. Look what he says. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Do you see that? So those that fell by the wayside, did they believe? No. The devil came and took the word of God out of their heart before they could understand it, before they could believe it. And it says, hey, what's the condition of being saved? Lest they should believe and be saved. Okay? Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Believe in the gospel. That's the condition of salvation. Now, I want you to keep, keep your finger there still in the book of Luke, please. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter eight. And turn back to uh, Matthew 13 verse 20. So we've confirmed that the first seed that was sown are non-believers, haven't we? We've confirmed that. Verse number 20 now. Verse number 20. Uh, sorry, yeah, Matthew 18, sorry. Matthew 13, verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Now, did this person receive the gospel? Did he receive the word? Yes. In fact, he receives it with joy. Okay, he's overjoyed to hear the words. But look at verse 21. And have, yet have he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Yeah, by and by he is offended. Okay? Now, 
You say, but did this guy get saved? Well, if you receive the word, what do you think? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, right? Receiving is, is another way of saying, believing, okay? Now, you want proof of that? That's why we've got Luke chapter 8. Go back to Luke chapter 8. Sorry for this. This is a bit of a Bible study, but it's such an important parable, such an important doctrine, okay? Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. So it's the same group of people, same parable. We're just continuing on. It says, They on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. Hey, same group, right? And these have no roots. Look at this. Which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Hey, did these people believe? Yes, they believed, right? And what was the condition of being saved? Just in the past verse, it said, lest they should believe and be saved. So if this group of people believe, they receive the word with joy, are they saved? Absolutely, they're saved. Okay? Now, it says for a while believe. Okay, for a while. Okay, now let me, let me say this to you. Salvation, as soon as you believe on Christ, you are saved. Okay? You don't need to persevere in faith forever. You don't need to keep the, the path forever. Okay? If you think salvation is by keeping the commandments, by, by walking faithfully all the days of your life, then you're believing a gospel by works. Okay? Because you believe it's by the perseverance of that person that will keep them saved or will make them saved. No. The moment you believe on Christ, you're born again and you're saved. Amen. Now, you could be an unfaithful Christian. That's a sad thing. I'm not encouraging you to be that way. But the truth is, you'll be saved. You'll be in heaven. You just won't have many rewards. You won't have much to rejoice in in heaven. Hey, but you're saved. Okay, praise God. You're going to be washing someone's... You know, toilets in heaven. No, no, probably not. Okay, but you'll be serving someone else in heaven, okay? That's fine. You're saved. Praise God. It's still a good thing. So I just want to prove that to you from, from the book of Luke. Go back to Matthew 13, verse 22. Matthew 13, verse 22. Let's look at the next group here. Oh, sorry, I, I shouldn't finish. I should, I should say, the reason these people gave up on the faith, that the reason that they said, like, they were no longer zealous for the Lord, it told us there in verse 21, for when tribulation or persecution, persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. You see, there are some believers that will get saved and they think, man, this is awesome, praise God, but they're not mature, they haven't developed and temptations, tribulations, trials, persecutions, you know, they, you know maybe even, even their families turn against them, you know, and, and it upsets them and they'll be like, you know what, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth serving the Lord. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to stay quiet. You know, I'm saved, yeah, praise God, but I'm just not going to do anything for the Lord. Because I, I can't face this persecution. I can't stand up for the word of God. They're saved. Okay? But the reality is there are some people, there might be even people within this church that when persecution comes, they'll just hide and, and not stand up for the Lord. It's possible. All right? Let's keep reading. Verse number 22. Matthew 13, verse 22. He, he also that receives seed amongst the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now we're going to understand what it means to be fruitful very soon. Okay? What does it mean to be fruitful? Okay? So this person, I'll, I'll say to you, is also a believer, also receives the word. Okay? But instead of you know, seeking the kingdom of God first, instead of seeking to serve the Lord first, what comes first in their life? The care of this world. Okay, the care of this world, the seedfulness of riches, it chokes the word and they become unfruitful. You see, the only way you can be fruitful for the Lord, the only way you can be a fruitful servant for God is when you give up on the riches of this world. When you no longer you know, pursue the riches, the wealth, you know, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, when you can put the world behind you, that's the point when you can start becoming fruitful for God. It's very difficult for a Christian to have one foot in the world and another foot in church and trying to serve the Lord. It's hard. You can't, Jesus Christ he says you can't serve two masters. You can't serve him and mammon, you know, you know riches at the same time. You know, quite often, you know, what you'll find is those that have the greatest riches in heaven are probably going to be those that didn't have many riches on this earth because they weren't pursuing that on the earth. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't all about the riches. You know, but it was about, you know, serving the Lord God. So we'll soon see what it means to be fruitful. Let's keep reading there in verse 23. Verse 23. But he that received seed into the good ground 
is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruits and bringeth forth, some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. You say, what is this fruit? What is this guy producing? What are these numbers? Look, what's this hundredfold? A hundred, sixty, thirty. How is he being fruitful? Why is God giving us these numbers? And some of you guys know this verse, Proverbs 11, verse 30. What is the fruit of the Christian? What is the fruit of the believer? What is it? A lot of people think it's the fruit of the Spirit. No, no, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, what's the fruit of the Christian? Proverbs 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Hey, what's the fruit of a believer? The winning of souls. Okay, that's your fruit. You know, my children are known as the, you know, the fruit of my loins, the fruit of the womb, if you want. When you have natural born children, that's the fruit of the natural man. You give birth to natural children. Hey, what's the fruit of the spiritual man? Spiritual children. Those that get saved, those that believe on Christ. That's how the spiritual man or the righteous man brings forth fruit. All right. So what are these numbers? A hundredfold, sixty. 30, you know, I would say to you, these are numbers that are achievable. These are numbers that you can see saved. You can't see 30 people saved in your life. You can't see 60. You can't see 100. Maybe some of you have already won more than 100 people to the Lord. In fact, I know a lot of people that have won more than 100 people to the Lord. Okay, but these are real numbers. Some people think, especially when you've never won someone to the Lord, you're going to think, how, 30? I mean, that's never going to happen in my life. You know, I'll rejoice if I just get one person saved in my life. And that's a good, good goal to have. That's where you start, the one person. But you know what? You can. You know, if, if you just go in, if you just, look, look, we have 52 weeks in a year. If you make it your goal to go soul winning once a week, you have a good chance of seeing one person saved a week. You have a good chance of that. Imagine you see someone get saved every week. That's 52 people's salvations right there. You've already met, met the fit 30 and you're on your way to seeing the 60, uh, the 60 fold. So what we see here, guys, is that final sowing of the seed is a fruitful believer. Someone that is saved, but not just saved, but actually going out there, preaching the gospel and being fruitful for the Lord. Seeing souls saved. All right. Let's keep reading. Verse 24. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat. And went his way. Now I quickly did a Google search on the word tares, and I found out that it's a type of grass that looks identical to wheat. Like in its early stages, as it grows, the tares look just like wheat. Okay, but you only notice that it's not wheat once it's fully ripened, once it's fully developed. Okay, once the grain sort of comes up. And in fact, Jesus says that in verse 26. He says, "But when the blade, so that's like the grain, when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit." Then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst, uh, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? You see, this is another, another hard teaching. Something else that's hard for us to understand. You see, now I don't really want to say this because I, I love this church. I do. I love each one of you. You know, but it's possible Okay, it's possible that there are tares amongst the wheat. It's possible. Okay, you say, well, maybe not in this church. Okay, but in this world, okay, there are going to be people that sound like believers. They, they look holy, they look righteous. And, for, and as far as you're concerned, that person's saved. That person's a believer. But you know what? Tares look just like wheat. You know, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing, if you will, looks just like a, like a sheep, you know, but it's a wolf inside. It's the same kind of teaching here, is that there are tares amongst the wheat and it's going to become a surprise. It's not obvious because they look just like the wheat. Okay, let's keep reading there. Verse number 28. He said unto them, and the enemy have done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then go, uh, sorry, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Uh, he said, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. So this is obviously a farming illustration. So if you pull out the tares, you know, the, the, the roots are going to be tangled with the wheat. And by pulling out the tares, you're also going to rip up the wheat. So don't do it. Okay? You're going to damage the wheat. Okay? We'll see what the lesson is there in a minute. Let's keep reading. Verse 30. 
let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, just by looking at the parable, you, you should have a rough idea of what this is about. If the tares are going to be burnt, but the wheat's going to be gathered in, in God's barns, what do you think that's about? It's obviously about the believers being the wheat being gathered in the barns and the non-believers, the tares being burnt up. Hell, the lake of fire. Okay, I think that's... For you that already know the fundamentals of the faith, you already know that truth, that's where these parables make sense. Okay, They make sense. Now, drop down to verse 36. Drop down to verse 36. Because Jesus Christ explains this parable later on in verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So you see, even the disciples at this stage, they didn't really get it. This parable. Can you explain it to us, Jesus? Now, I think some of you guys already understood it. Okay? But they're asking, Jesus, can you explain it to us? Verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. Okay? The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Now, if you're saved, brothers and sisters, you know who you are? You are the children of the kingdom. Okay, you're in this parable. You're, you're, the, you're represented by the wheat here. Verse number 39. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish verse 38. It says, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, I already spoke to you a little bit about reprobates, people that have lost their chance. Okay, now I haven't got the time to go through all this. The Old Testament calls them children of Belial, of, of Belial, okay? Uh, here, Belial is just another name for the devil. Here, they're known as children of the wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Satan. You know, Satan's got his own children, spiritually speaking. You know, these are reprobates. These are people. It's like when you're, when you're saved, you're born again. You're born into God's family. Okay, you'll become a spiritual child of God. And there are some people in this world, I'm not saying every non-believer, I'm just saying certain people in this world that have become reprobate, they have, as it were, become a spiritual child of the devil. And you know what we say when we're born again in God's family? You know, it doesn't, like, it doesn't matter if you're, a, you're an unfaithful child. It doesn't matter if you're a disobedient child. You know, you're still a child of God. Once you're born, you can never be unborn. Don't we say that about the salvation of, of believers. Well, you know, when someone becomes a child of the devil, they cannot be unborn out of that family. You know, once saved, always saved. Once damned, always damned. You know, that's, that's the doctrine of the reprobates. You know, I know it's not popular, but you see this play out throughout this chapter. Okay? Let's keep reading. Uh, verse number, number 39. And Jesus makes it very clear here. The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So let's understand this. Jesus says, look, this is about the end of the world, end times prophecy. Okay? Now, I know some people have taught this in relation to the rapture. I've, I've heard preaching about the rapture. I, I do think you can take certain illustrations, certain applications here, and apply it to the rapture. I think so. But I think this is more to do with the end of the millennium. And I'm going to prove that to you in a moment. Okay? But notice Jesus says this is the end of the world, of, of, yeah, of, this, of, the, of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Verse 40 as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Okay, so twice Christ saying, look, the end of the world, the end of this world. Okay, so when does this take place? The end of this world. All right, that's, a, that's an easy question. All right, in verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Now, I want you to notice there that Jesus said, look, out of his kingdom. Now, we know there's a future millennial kingdom of Christ to come. Okay? Now, that would make sense if they're being gathered at the end of that millennium because Christ's kingdom is established. Okay? Now, like I said, I know we can apply principles today. I know we can apply principles about the rapture. But the primary application is to the end times. The, the end. Okay? And, I, and I'll show to you why this is about the end of the millennium in a moment. And then it says there in verse um, 42, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire... There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now let's understand this. Keep your finger there. Go to Revelation chapter 20, please. Revelation chapter 20. I hope you don't mind a bit of a Bible study today. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. So we know these tares <clears throat> will be cast into the lake of fire, right? A furnace of fire. 
and shall be wailing, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, I don't fully understand this, brethren, but at the end of the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, Satan is loosed and somehow is able to get a grand army to fight against Jesus Christ. These are the tares that have grown amongst the wheat here. Let's keep reading. Verse number nine. And they went out on the breath of the earth and come past the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Look at this. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Look, don't fall into this teaching that says hell is sort of this temporal... What do they, they teach that it's um, annihilation. Where if someone's cast into hell, they're utterly destroyed, they're not being tortured. No. Verse number 10 makes it very clear that when you're cast into the lake of fire, that they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. What a scary thing. You know, and we don't like reading these things, but you know what? You know what's going to get you out soul winning? You know what's going to get you, you know, worried about the souls in our community? Your unsaved family, your unsaved friends, your unsaved co-workers. You know what's going to get you to preach the gospel to them? Is when you finally realize that they're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Right. It's a sad thing. Now that should drive you to get out there. It should drive you to rejoice in your salvation and drive you to get out there to preach the gospel and be that fruitful seed you know, that was sown. Be that fruitful person. Now, let's, um, I'm going to keep proving this to you a little bit. So we see at the end of the thousand years that there are certain people, the tares, that are cast into the lake of fire and the devil along with them, okay? The children of the devil, if you want to put it that way. Now, uh, let me see, what do I... Uh, keep your finger in Revelation. We're going to go back there. And go back to Matthew 13, please. Matthew 13, verse 43. Matthew 13, verse 43. There's a bit of scriptures that we need to compare here, but it all comes together. I love the Bible because it's all perfect. It all aligns perfectly when, when you look at multiple scriptures. Verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who have ears to hear, let him hear. Notice that here, once at the end of the thousand years, once the tares are cast into hell, notice here it says that we will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now, I want you to think about this. The millennial reign of Christ. Well, I just, I just gave it away. I was going to say, who, who's in charge during that millennium? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? Okay. But notice here, in verse 43, it says, the kingdom of their father. Okay. Who's God the Father? It's the Father, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ the Trinity. I won't go into all that right now. Okay? So there is a time when the kingdom becomes the kingdom of the Father. Say, so when does that take place? You don't need to turn there. You've already got your fingers in too many places. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 says this. This is the end of the millennium, by the way. It says this. Then cometh the end. Notice when Jesus says at the end of the world. Then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he, have, well, sorry, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. You see, at the end of the millennium, once everything has put, been put under the authority of Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ takes that kingdom and gives it to God the Father. And that's why we see in Matthew 13 now, it's been referred to as the kingdom of the Father. And we're going to be shining brightly as the sun in that kingdom. Now, you guys are still in Revelation. Go to Revelation 21, verse 1. Revelation 21, verse 1. Now, what we had read er earlier in Revelation was Revelation 20. Okay, so we're now in the next chapter. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Just very quickly, what is this kingdom of the Father? What is be what he's been talking about? You remember at the end of this world, Jesus Christ was talking about? Now, Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Does that all come together for you? When Jesus Christ says the end of this world, why is it the end of this world? It's because God the Father, once the kingdom is given to him, he creates a new heaven and a new, uh, new heaven and a new earth. Okay? And it's only going to be populated by the wheat. Those that have the brightness of the sun, those that are saved, those that are believers. The tares at this point in time have been completely done away with. They've been all cast into the lake of fire. 
All right, that's the explanation of that parable, guys. Go back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. And we're going to backtrack a little bit because I missed some verses here for it all to come together. Matthew uh, 13, verse 31. Matthew 13, verse 31. I get to preach to you a, a, a meaty, meaty sermon tonight because I didn't get to preach to you last week. So that's all good. Verse 31. Let's look at verse 31. It says here, another parable. And I haven't got time to go into great depth here, but I'll give you the principle and then you guys can study it out when you have time. Okay. And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest amongst herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, I want you to notice something about this parable, especially, and the next one, okay? It starts off with the mustard seed, right? The mustard seed then is sown, it becomes a what? It becomes a tree, right? And then, is that the end of the parable? No, and then uh, the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches of that tree. This parable has a three-fold process. The seed, the tree, the birds in the branches. Okay, I want you to notice that. Let's keep reading. Verse number 33. Matthew 13, verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. You guys know what leaven is? It's like a yeast, okay, used to uh, leaven bread. And it says, which a woman took, look at this, and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. You see, this woman here is making bread. She takes three measures of meal. Now, I don't believe God puts in numbers for no reason. Okay, this, this lines up perfectly with the, previous with the previous parable of the threefold process. Okay, now it's three measures or, or three, uh, it's like saying three kilograms of meal, something like that. Okay, and she puts leaven it, in it so the whole will be leavened. All right, now let's look at this, uh, verse number Verse number 34, I'll make, I'll make this all make sense to you soon. Verse 34, all these things Jesus spake unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. So let's explain these parables, these two parables, this threefold process, and it's referred to both times as the kingdom of heaven. Now, I haven't got time to go through all this. This requires its own sermon all by itself. But just, it's very, it, it, uh, it was very hard for me to understand until I got it, okay? But the kingdom of heaven operates in the same way there is a threefold process in the kingdom of god in the kingdom of heaven okay let me explain this to you the kingdom of god is available here today it is not physical it is not visible okay but how do we enter into the kingdom of god by being born again jesus said that a man cannot uh, enter the kingdom of god unless he's born again you cannot see the kingdom of god unless you are born again you see if you are saved the new man, the spiritual man in you, has entered into that kingdom already. And when you go out and you preach the gospel and people are getting saved, these people are being brought into the kingdom. You see, the kingdom of God is here today, but it's here in the spiritual sense. In a, in not a physical sense, in a spiritual sense. That's why Jesus Christ, if you guys remember, said, the kingdom of God is within you. It is, in a sense, because that new man is already in that kingdom. But does that mean there's no physical kingdom to come? No, of course there is. And we know what that next stage is, don't we? We know what that next process is. That's when Christ comes back and establishes His millennial reign here on this earth. It's going to be physical. It's going to be literal. And you're, you know, not just spiritually enter in, but you'll be able to physically enter into that kingdom. That's like the kingdom has now been leavened a little more. Okay, but is that, the, is that it? No, because that's why we call it the millennial reign of Christ, because we, only, we know it's, it, it's not forever. We know it's, it's temporal. It's only 1,000 years long. And at the end of the thousand years, what happens? The kingdom gets given to the Father, who creates the new heavens and the new earth. Now this is the third stage of the kingdom. And now the whole kingdom of God has been fully leavened. It's been fully raised up. You know, so it's a process, a spiritual kingdom available today, a, a physical kingdom in the future, but it's only temporal, a thousand years. And then an eternal kingdom, which is then given to God the Father. That's the threefold process that we see here. It's like the mustard seed. And actually, let's get, we'll keep going. All right, let's... let's uh, Actually, does Jesus Christ explain? I can't remember right now. Sorry. It's like the mustard seed. It's small. It starts off small. You know, if I were to throw a mustard seed on the ground right now, before I started church, you probably wouldn't even know there's a mustard seed on the ground. 
Okay, and that, that's a spiritual sense of it. Okay, but then it becomes that tree. It's like that millennial kingdom, and then the birds lodge in the nest is like that final, uh, you know, when we all have the new heavens and new earth, and we all lodge and live there. All right, let's, uh, if that doesn't make sense to you guys, I don't have time to go through it all, but please ask me after the service. Let's go to Matthew 13, verse 44 now. Verse 44, verse 44. Now, if you understand the kingdom, you're going to understand these parables. You can understand the next ones, okay? Verse 44. Again, when it says again, this is another parable, okay? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now, this reminds me of the gold rush in Australia, okay? Uh, we, don't have, we haven't got that much gold now. Like, you kind of have to be lucky to find gold. But you know, there were areas where, where people would find gold, okay? And they wouldn't tell anyone. They would start then mining and, and starting to mine, trying to get all the gold from themselves. And the whole reason why it was called the gold rush is because news traveled. Hey, there's gold in this area. And people would leave their jobs, people would leave their families and go and mine for gold. Why? Because they knew they could become rich. They knew if, if they dug in enough, they would become rich. It's the same kind of idea here. This man found a treasure in a field and he goes, man, I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm going to hide this. I'm going to go sell all that I have, buy the whole field so I can uncover all the treasure to be found. Let's keep reading verse number 45. Same kind of parable. Again, the kingdom, another parable here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So this man sees this beautiful pearl. He says, I want that pearl. He sells all that he has and goes and buys that pearl. What's the teaching here, guys? What's the teaching? It's very simple. Once you understand the kingdom of God, once you understand that there are rewards to be had, once you understand that you need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, once you understand, hey, I want to be rich in the kingdom of heaven. I want to have treasures in heaven. You know, I want, to be, I want to meet Christ and for Christ to say, Thou good and faithful servant. Once that's made sense to you, then you're going to now desire to invest heavily into, into the kingdom of God. You know, no longer you're going to have the desires, the cares of this world, and to see how much money can I make and what reputation, what name can I make for myself. No, once the spirit of man understands, man, I want to be rich in the kingdom of heaven. I want to have those rewards. Then as it were, you would sell all that you have. And seek that kingdom first. Okay? That's what we should be like. We should be desiring to lay up treasures in heaven, not treasures on this earth. I'm not saying you quit your jobs. Because God says work hard. God says get married, have kids and provide for your family. You do what you need to do. But hey, you don't need to waste your time seeking treasures and wealth beyond what you need. Hey, use that time to serve the Lord. Use that time to invest in heavenly things. Verse number 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and it sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So it's like fishermen, they just let out a net, they get fish, they get, maybe they get other things in there that aren't worth anything and they start casting out that which is bad. Okay. Verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from amongst the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So this is the same thing that we learnt about, about the, the, the tares and the wheat. Okay, the tares being cast into the fire. Same thing. The illustration is that a net will go out. They'll gather the good, but the bad will be burnt into like fire at the end of the world. I won't rehash all of that, but it's the same teaching there. And then uh, <clears throat> verse 51. Jesus saith unto them, to who? His disciples, right? Have ye understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. You see, the disciples now have finally understood these parables. And what I want you guys to do is for you to finally understand these parables. I want you to finally understand the kingdom of God and to finally understand just how important, how valuable it is for you to invest into God's kingdom, to invest into God's work. I want Jesus Christ to say to you, Have you understood these things? And for you to say, Yea, Lord, I get it. You know, I, I get it. I need to serve you. I need to seek the kingdom first in my life. Verse 52. Verse 52. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And I'll just be honest with you, I don't really get this verse. 
I don't, I don't, I don't fully understand it. If you've got some ideas, you know, let me know. I'll, I'll give you my first thoughts as I read this. Is remember the prophets of old could not understand the dark sayings? And blessed are we today that can. It's been revealed unto us. Well, I think what's, what's being said here is that the scribe is like an Old Testament scribe writing the Old Testament. That um, the things that he wrote about uh, brings forth things that are out of his treasure, things that are new and old. And I think what's being said here is the truth of this teaching, what we're hearing today, is not a new teaching. In fact, it's an old teaching. It's an old teaching. We know it because we saw it in the Old Testament. We saw that fathers passed down this teaching generation to generation. But what's new is the understanding. When Christ came, He's come and enlightened our understanding. That's new now. We're blessed because we now fully understand what the kingdom of God is. We understand the Trinity. We understand being born again in the Holy Ghost. We understand the millennial reign of Christ. We understand God the Father. The Trinity was something that was taught by Jesus Christ and understanding how that all fits into the kingdom of God, the threefold process of the kingdom. I think that's what's being said there. But if you've got some other ideas, let me know. I'm all ears. Okay? Now, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, read from verse number 53. We're up to that now. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. So we're, we're over the parables now. We're just, we're just wrapping up this chapter now. So he's gone into a synagogue to teach, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? So who was Jesus Christ? The carpenter's son. As far as they were concerned, right? Who's he, who are they referring to? Joseph. Joseph as the stepfather of Jesus Christ. You see that Joseph here was a carpenter. Okay? And it says, Is not his mother called Mary? Hey, we know Joseph. We know Mary. And it says, And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Hey, we know the family. We know, we know Jesus and his family and his parents. We know them. Now, just Before I go into all of that, I just want you to keep your finger there. Go to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. So we saw in the book of Matthew that Jesus Christ is called the carpenter's son, right? So Joseph was a carpenter by trade. Now look at Mark chapter 6, verse 3. It's the same, same people asking the same questions, but now it's captured in a different way. Mark chapter 6, not a contradiction, it's just another truth, okay? Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Is not this the carpenter? Who's the carpenter? Jesus Christ. All right? Who is, is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters he with us? And they were offended at him. So you can go back to Matthew 23 now. Uh, 13, sorry, Matthew 13. And uh, I just wanted to show you that Joseph, his stepfather, Jesus' stepfather was a carpenter, right? But then notice that in Mark, he confirms that Jesus Christ was also a carpenter. Okay? And how old was Jesus Christ when he started his full-time ministry? He was about 30 years old. So what do you think he was doing until he was 30 years old? He was working the carpentry trade. He was working the family business, right? He was working with Joseph, his father, who was a carpenter. He learned the family trade. He was a carpenter. I say, why are, you, why are you saying that? I'm just trying to say to you guys is that we know we need to set the kingdom of God first, but I don't want you to fall into the trap of thinking, you know what? I'm just going to quit my job. I'm just going to leave my family, and I'm just going to go and serve God with the rest of my life. That's not what you're called to do. Men, you're called to work. You're called to provide. Even Jesus set us the example. You think he needed to become a carpenter, really? Right? But he waited till he was 30 years old before he started the ministry. Hey, he got himself a trade. He got himself work. He worked hard. He provided for his family, for his household. I don't know. It's possible some people think that Joseph passed away at an early age. And here we may have Jesus Christ as being the oldest son of the family, working hard and providing for the family because the father had passed on. That's a possibility. But notice that Jesus Christ made sure that he was working hard. He had a job. He had a trade. And then he went into the ministry. Once everything was settled and, and done, then he went into the ministry. Okay? And I don't want you guys, and I'm not even for Bible college, but I don't want young people to think, man, I'm just going to go into full-time ministry. Look, you need to live a life first. You need to work hard first. A lot of the things that you learn as a preacher, as a pastor, as, as, as a full-time servant for God, are the things, that you, you, the things that you apply, are things you've learned in the workforce, the things you've learned in the family. 
You know, a lot of the way I run church and talk to people are things I learned as a dad, speaking to my kids, you know, or, or, or being a manager, having employees under me. You know, that's how, the things that you learn in the workplace, you're going to be able to apply in your full-time job. Okay, so, and by the way, when you work, you are working for the kingdom of God so long as you set Jesus Christ as your master. So long as in your mindset, you have, hey, I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of who your employer is. You put Christ first and you can serve him and you'll still be serving in the kingdom of God because you're serving your Lord and master, aren't you? Okay. Now let's keep reading verse 56. And his sisters, are they not with us all? Whence then hath this man all these things? How does he know so much? Why has he got so much knowledge? Why we know this family. We've seen Jesus Christ from a young man. He never went to Bible college. You know, he was a carpenter. How can he have so much knowledge? That's what they're saying about him. Verse 57. And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his, in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So what Jesus is saying is, look, if you, if you seek to serve God, you become a pastor, you become a preacher, you become a prophet, as it were, in that sense, okay? Those that are going to reject you the most, those that are going to be the most disloyal to you, most dishonorable, dishonoring to you, are, are your own kinsfolk, like your own neighbors, your own family, your own friends, the people that have known you are more likely to reject you. Go like, how can you be a pastor? How can you be? I know you. You know, I know what you got up to in your, in your own life. How can, you know? And that's why Jesus Christ says here that a prophet is not without honor. So every prophet has honor. Every prophet has honor when they preach, save or accept in his own country and is in his own house. Okay? So Jesus recognized that you know, if he was away from, from his family, away from his house, away from his country as it were, there were going to be people that would listen to him, that would honor his teaching. And that's why it says in verse 58, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Hey, if you want Christ to do mighty works in your life, what are you going to need? You're going to need belief. You're going to need faith. You, go, you know, you want prayers answered. You need to be able to ask the Lord in faith that that prayer can be answered in accordance to his will. But it's when you lack faith that God will not do mighty works in your life. And I'll just wrap it up by saying this. This verse here in verse 57 <laughs> It is sort of one of the main reasons when I went to start a church, I, I wanted to get out of Sydney. Because I was like, well, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, right? In his, in his own house. So surely if I go elsewhere, then people are going to hear me. If you're gonna, well, I don't know. For some reason, God's brought me back to Sydney anyway to start this church. So I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe I was misapplying that verse somehow. But that, that, was, that, that was the verse that kind of got me thinking I need to get out of Sydney. Anyway, guys, I hope you now understand all these parables. If I haven't explained, I had to go through them pretty quickly. There was a lot there. If there's something you haven't understood, please ask me after the service. Let's pray.